The Rachel Maddow Show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Ed. Have a great weekend, my you friend. Too. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks to you at home for staying with us for the next hour. This is going to be kind of an epic show. All right. Um, are you familiar with the concept of Wild Card Weekend? This is Wild Card Weekend. It's the opening weekend of the NFL playoffs, which is important to know because even if you are someone who does not care at all about football, you should know that the people in your life who do care about football are going to be very distracted this weekend because there are four really good games, two on Saturday and two on Sunday. Uh, it's called Wild Card Weekend for reasons that are mostly too boring to explain here. Suffice to say, it's basically the first weekend of the playoffs, which includes teams that did not all win their divisions, uh, but they got into the playoffs anyway as wild cards. On the occasion of this Wild Card Weekend in football land, the man who has decided to make himself Washington's political wild card is the brand newly retired Massachusetts Congressman Barney Frank. Barney Frank kicked off the weekend by going on TV this morning and saying he would please like to be picked to be the new senator from Massachusetts. He said he would like to be the interim replacement for John Kerry, who's expected to be confirmed soon as President Obama's new Secretary of State. A month ago, I know, a few weeks ago, in fact, I, I said I wasn't interested. It was kind of like you're about to graduate, and they said you got to go to summer school. But that <laughs> deal, that deal now means that February, March, and April are going to be among the most important months in American financial. So you consider it? If I, yes, in fact, in fact you know, I'm not going to be coy. It's not anything I've ever been good at. Um, I, I've told the governor that I would now like, frankly, to do that. I told the governor that I would like to do that. Uh, Barney Frank then said to Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick on national TV, he said, quote, coach, put me in. This is not usually how these things work, right? Most people don't publicly lobby for this kind of job. You're supposed to say something diplomatic like, oh, I'd be honored to accept the position if it's offered to me. But really, that's a decision for the governor to make. That's what everybody else does. Barney Frank, though, wild card, which is why everybody loves him. Uh, here's how Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick reacted to that rather surprising development just a couple of hours later. Would you have preferred that he not go public? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> what I have preferred. Does it matter in the case of Congressman Fack, uh, Frank what I would have preferred in every case? Um, I have treated those conversations as confidential, and I think in every case, the other person has treated them as, uh, as confidential. In, in, uh, in uh, Congressman Frank's case, he's chosen not to on his end. I'm going to keep my end. It is probably true uh, that Deval Patrick has had the conversation about the Senate seat with a bunch of people. But Barney Frank is just going on TV and talking about it and saying that he wants the job. Really, nobody does it that way. Uh, the serving Massachusetts Senator John Kerry, of course, has been nominated to replace Hillary Clinton at state. We learned this week that he is now starting to prep for confirmation hearings. He was at the State Department all day Wednesday. The staff there say they now expect him to start reporting to the department regularly. They say they're now working with the Foreign Relations Committee to pick a date for his confirmation hearings. Should he be confirmed, what happens to Mr. Kerry's Senate seat is this. The Massachusetts governor, who you see on the right side of your screen there, Deval Patrick, will appoint somebody to fill the seat. So without any sort of political contest, that person gets to hold the Senate job for a few months until a special election will be held this spring or summer in Massachusetts. Now, Barney Frank is saying that while he would like to be the interim senator for a few months, he doesn't want the permanent gig. He says he will not run in the special election when it happens. The Democratic Party in Massachusetts, including Barney Frank, have now pretty much coalesced behind who they, or coalesced around who they want their Senate candidate to be for the Senate seat in the special election, who they want to hold the seat long term, right? And it's this guy. His name is Ed Markey. Ed Markey is currently a member of the House from Massachusetts. And what Ed Markey is doing right now to prepare for a potentially very difficult, very high stakes battle for this very high profile Senate seat, a race that will stand alone on the political calendar in the springtime, a race that will get a ton of national attention. What is Ed Markey doing now to get ready for that? He is picking a huge fight with the single most profitable industry on the face of the earth. Woohoo! Ed Markey is known in Washington for essentially being the sheriff of the oil industry. He's the top Democrat in the House on energy issues, and he has been really confrontational with the oil industry, particularly on safety issues. 
at a time when lots and lots of his colleagues in Congress have been quietly and happily awash in oil money. But Ed Markey has just been a bulldog on the oil industry over the years, particularly on public safety. During the Deepwater Horizon disaster in 2010, for example, it was Ed Markey who brought national attention to the fact that the big oil companies, including BP, had basically just mailed it in when it came to their oil spill response plans. These documents that were supposed to describe in great detail exactly what they would do in the event of a disaster, Ed Markey hauled the oil industry's executives up to Capitol Hill to call them on what was really in those plans to do this. These five companies have response plans that are virtually identical. The plans cite identical response capabilities and tout identical ineffective equipment. Like BP, three other companies include references to protecting walruses, which have not called the Gulf of Mexico home for three million years. Two other plans are such dead ringers for BPs that they list a phone number for the same long dead expert. It just seems to me that for each of your companies, the only technology you seem to be relying upon is a Xerox machine to put together your response plans. To the extent that Ed Markey is nationally famous, it is for that sort of thing. And he is now looking, think about this for a second. He, he is now looking at a hugely high profile Senate race in a couple of months that depending on who he's running against, maybe Scott Brown, uh, it, it could be a multi, multi, multi million dollar special election involving lots of outside cash. Elizabeth Warren was just officially sworn in as a U.S. Senator yesterday. In her run for Senate from Massachusetts, she made herself the nation's most high-profile opponent of what is probably the second most profitable industry in the nation, the banking industry. The only industry that is scarier than that in terms of the power and influence that they throw around in Washington is the most profitable industry on earth, the oil industry. And the most pugnacious confronter of that industry is now going for the other Massachusetts Senate seat. Wow. Ed Markey has not just been an aggressive watchdog on the oil industry at times when there are high profile spills like the Deepwater Horizon spill, but also when the industry has stuff going on that does not get as much national attention. Like, for example, the situation we have going on right now in remote, hard to get to Alaska, where a Shell oil rig laden with 150,000 gallons of fuel and oil has run aground in one of the most pristine, most ecologically sensitive bodies of water in the country. Emergency response teams have been dropped onto that rig on each of the last three days. They report that the rig is upright and stable. They say that no fuel has leaked out to the ocean yet. But this is an ongoing crisis, and the response so far from Washington, led by Congressman Ed Markey, has been swift and rather loud. Congressman Markey is now demanding that Shell turn over whatever contingency plans they had for this rig operation. He provided a statement to us tonight in which he says that given this accident, given the safety failures in the past, he does not support any issue, he does not support issuing any new permits to drill in the Arctic. Yesterday, more than 40 of his colleagues in the House came out and publicly called for a federal investigation into this incident. And over the course of this ongoing situation up there, the news has just gotten worse and not better for Shell. Shell, Shell currently has two rigs in operation in the Arctic. The one on the left is the one that just ran aground off the coast. The one on the right is now, as of today, reportedly the subject of a criminal investigation. CBS News reporting tonight that the U.S. Coast Guard has opened up a criminal investigation into that shell rig as a result of, among other things, serious issues with the ship's safety management and pollution control systems. Tonight, shell personnel in Alaska who are responding to this latest accident appear to be doing everything they can to limit press coverage of what's going on up there. A reporter with the Anchorage Daily News, which is a great paper and has been doing intensive coverage on this, the eight, an ADN reporter attempted to get close to the command center today for this incident and reported that, quote, guards are stationed outside a meeting room that has been turned into a command post. They said no reporters were allowed inside and they wouldn't even let a photographer snap a quick picture or allow a reporter to glance at the sign-in sheet. This industry that has been facing pressure from Washington over and over again in recent years, again, with yet another one of these incidents, is in full damage control, again. 
Joining us now is Jerry Balenson. He's a deputy editor at Popular Mechanics. With a no-fly zone and a boat exclusion zone put in place by the Coast Guard and Shell, it is pretty much impossible to get first-hand reporting from the scene up there. But Mr. Balenson follows the oil and gas industries for Popular Mechanics, and he spent four days on board this specific Shell rig back in October. He's well-versed in the technological challenges that accompany oil exploration and drilling in the Arctic. What you're looking at here is some of his footage of the Kulik's pipe deck as it passed through the Beaufort, uh, the Beaufort Sea. Beaufort Sea, is that Beaufort, right? Beaufort, yes. Say, mm -hmm. uh, north of Alaska. Mr. Balenson, you obviously know these things better than I do. It's nice to have you here. Uh, thank you. Um, the unified command team up there in Alaska, which includes the Coast Guard and Shell, they've put up a five-mile no-fly zone, a one-mile no-boat zone around mm -hmm. this stranded rig. I tend to trust the Coast Guard, even if I don't trust the oil companies, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that is overkill or if that uh, is appropriate, given how much that will crimp the ability of any reporters to actually cover what's happening there. Yeah, it's a little hard for me to second guess the Coast Guard, which I really love. Those guys are really good, especially in Alaska. Um, there are helicopters flying around and they are putting uh, people on and off that rig. I would assume that it's for safety and that they, um, you know, those helicopter pilots are risking their lives every time they go out to that rig. So I would assume that they are trying to keep tourists and, yeah, probably journalists away, but not so much to maybe limit information as to limit access for you know, kind of safety reasons. I don't read too much into that. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't know whether or not to. As I said, I'm, I'm inclined to trust the Coast Guard in situations like mm -hmm. this, uh, if only purely on the basis of expertise. But it is also striking to see how much Shell is trying to keep this quiet and keep trying to keep reporters out and trying to keep journalism away from this, trying to downplay it. How big a risk do you think this is to this ecologically sensitive area? We're talking about 150,000 gallons of, of fuel and oil? Uh, it's a really great question. So there are two different issues, I think. One is this oil rig with this amount of fuel on board in this area, and the other one is Arctic drilling, and they're really two separate things. Yeah. So um, this is not a large amount of fuel compared to freighters that run aground. Um, a couple of years ago, or several years ago, there was a freighter in the Aleutians that ran aground, and often those uh, carry a lot of fuel, bunker fuel, which is very bad. It's just dark, gooey, disgusting stuff, and it's terrible to get into the water. Um, freighters and tankers also that run aground have posed a great risk. So I think that the Colic is, is a ship that's run aground. We certainly don't want any of that fuel in the water. The thing that I think that uh, politicians will be looking at, regulators will be looking at, is whether we want drilling in the Arctic, which yeah. is an entirely different and much bigger, in my mind, issue. Well, and that has a sort of new pointiness to it with the prospect of Ed Markey not just being the top Democrat in the House on this issue and being as a person who's being so so willing to be confrontational with the companies on this, but potentially going into a very high profile race and joining the Senate. Um, that puts a real political edge on it. Do you feel like the political concerns that have been expressed around the Arctic are well informed? Do you feel like there is reason to have real political concern over that? Oh, well, sure. You know, uh, one of the things that happened this year, Shell went through one mistake after another, and it, it just had a terrible year. There was um, air permits that were, they weren't able to comply with, a containment vessel that broke in a really dramatic fashion. And a lot of uh, even Shell's biggest critics um, were surprised that Shell didn't do better this year. Everyone really thought that they'd be able to pull off a year of drilling very smoothly. So there is a lot of really well-informed debate, especially in Alaska and especially up on the North Slope, about whether we should be uh, drilling for oil in the Arctic or not. And you know, Shell is only the first of several companies that have leases up there, and they're kind of out in front, but behind them is coming ConocoPhillips, Statoil, and some other companies. And so they're talking about real offshore industry, which has never existed up there. And that's um, an issue that'll be a big one in the next few years. And it's going to be continually a big one in the next few days, I think, as this situation continues to not get resolved up in Alaska. We hope that it will. Will you come back and talk to us about this, Mark? Uh, sure. I do think, I have heard that there is some reason to think that um, call it maybe pulled off of where it's grounded in the next couple of days. That hasn't been made public yet, but I sort of understand that that's what they're hoping to do. We will stay on it. Thank you for that. Jerry Balenson, deputy editor uh, of Popular Mechanics, spent four days above the uh, aboard the Colic uh, back in October. Appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right.